So, um, good afternoon. I'm glad that uh, so many people are here uh, despite the good weather. Although on second thought, maybe it is because of the hot weather and the fact that we have air conditioning here. So either way, I um, welcome you to um, today's uh, seminar, which is on intellectual property rights and access to innovation uh, in the case of uh, pharmaceuticals and the evidence uh, that we have uh, from uh, the implementation of the TRIPS agreement. Uh, and by way of background, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's quite unambiguous to say that you know, one of the elements of the TRIPS agreement that you know, really brought uh, policy change in the member countries of the WTO was the introduction of patent protection for pharmaceutical products, at least in those countries that previously did not protect uh, pharmaceutical um, products. Uh, and that you know, has prompted many economists uh, to look at uh, what uh, the effect uh, of that policy change has been on you know, pharmaceutical markets, uh, you know, various aspects uh, of uh, the performance of pharmaceutical markets. Uh, and also, personally, I believe you know, as time goes by, these types of studies will become even more promising because, uh, um, as probably all of you know, the TRIPS agreement came with a number of transition periods. Um, and not only the transition periods, but also it takes a long time um, for um, pharmaceutical patents that are being filed to have an effect uh, on pharmaceutical markets, given the, lay, the delay between patenting and the introduction of pharmaceutical products. So as time, time goes by, these types of studies uh, are becoming um, ever more promising. Now, we are very fortunate today to have uh, Professor Margaret uh, Kyle with us, uh, who uh, is an expert in this field. Uh, she's a professor at the Toulouse School of Economics, and. Uh, just by way of background, the Toulouse School of Economics uh, is probably one of the premier schools in, in Europe, not, if not in the world, on industrial economics. Uh, there are a number of really well-known scholars there, and this is probably one of the best places in the world uh, to do research on industrial economics uh, and, and uh, innovation. And uh, Professor Kyle um, has uh, done a lot of interesting work uh, generally on innovation and in particular uh, on, on the pharmaceutical industry. Um, she previously was a professor at uh, London Business School, at Duke University and at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, she received uh, her PhD from the Massachusetts Institute uh, of Technology. So we're very fortunate uh, to, to have uh, you with us today. Um, we discussed that uh, Margaret would uh, take uh, questions throughout the presentation, but uh, if those questions could be mainly, mainly of the clarifying type, and the more the broader questions on the paper, I suggest we leave for the for the questions and answer period. Uh, so, Margaret, welcome. So thank you very much. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here. I'm always happy to have an excuse to visit Geneva and particularly to present this work to people who are really experts on some of the details here. So I'd like to emphasize that this is preliminary work and I'm here uh, in the hopes that I can learn something from you. If I've missed something important, if I have the detail wrong, please do let me know, that's extremely important. Uh, as was just stated, uh, please feel free to interrupt me. I become a, a bit nervous that everyone goes, has gone to sleep if I don't get questions with some regularity. I promise that I will try to leave time for the end so that we can have a, um, a full discussion at the end. And one other detail I should, I should note is that the data that I'm using in this paper was made available to me from Pfizer. So I did not receive payment directly from Pfizer. I've just received the data, but it's important to make this disclosure uh, up front. Uh, and last bit, which is obvious from the title slide, this is joint work with Yi Chen at Northwestern and Hui uh, Jie, I'm hoping I say, say his name right, uh, at University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay, um, so I'm sure that this is unnecessary for, uh, for this particular audience, but in general, as we know, uh, there's a trade-off that we face in setting policy for intellectual property rights. There's uh, a need to balance dynamic and static efficiency, or another way of putting that is that we need to balance the incentives for innovation that are created through intellectual property rights from the short-run costs that are associated with the fact that intellectual property rights provide some market power and allow firms potentially to increase prices, which has the uh, unfortunate effect of reducing access to their, their innovations. I think in the economics profession, there's general agreement that the optimal balance 
of dynamic and static efficiency probably varies across countries and across industries. Uh, in other words, we probably think that the appropriate patent term in pharmaceuticals is not the same as the appropriate, the ideal patent term in something like electronics. Okay. But we're dealing with the realities of setting policy. We can't uh, easily set different uh, patent terms for different industries and expect that to be the same over time. Um, I think there's also general agreement among economists that different countries will see it as in their interest to implement intellectual property rights at different times, in particular at different stages of development, and depending on uh, what their own domestic needs are. And historically, in fact, that's been the case, that when a country hit a certain level of development that, uh, and had some, uh, some domestic firms interested in protecting their innovations, it's at that point that they would implement patent protection. Having said that, uh, as, as we're all aware, over the last few years or a few decades, there's been a move towards harmonizing intellectual property rights across countries. So even though we might think that the optimal balance varies across countries, uh, in practice, if you are compliant with the TRIPS agreement, if you're a WTO member, you're expected to have at least some minimum level of protection uh, for, from patents, copyrights, trademarks, et cetera, which is the same everywhere. Okay, so there's, of course, still some variation across countries, but, um, but some effort to harmonize as well. Uh, and I think there's, uh, this is probably not a very controversial statement, that over time uh, we've seen a general increase in the duration of patent protection, in the enforcement of patent protection, and in the scope of patents, uh, as in the definition of what can be patented. Now, there have been some important decisions in the U.S. Supreme Court recently that maybe are starting to pare that back a little bit, and that's certainly an area where there's lots of differences across countries. But as a general statement, I think IPRs have become more, more prominent uh, over the last couple of decades. In the case of pharmaceuticals, this has been a very contentious issue. Um, so I have here some quotes uh, from the, the two extreme positions, I would say. So one from an NGO, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, um, which in general uh, objects to intellectual property rights, seeing them as a barrier to, uh, to treatment for people in, in a lot of poorer countries. Uh, on the other side, you have, as an example, the U.S. Trade Representative here um, saying, in fact, stronger IPRs are in the interests of developing countries. The belief is that stronger patent protection will increase the willingness of firms to make their innovations available in poor countries and increase uh, the availability of medicines. Okay. So uh, it's been difficult to, to find uh, some points of agreement between these two extreme positions. Uh, there was a lot of controversy when, what I'm going to focus on here, uh, the TRIPS agreement was, was being negotiated. And, you know, I think that there's, there remains a lot of, uh, of controversy over this question. So I'm going to focus in this paper specifically on the TRIPS agreement because um, this was a change that required many developing countries to make an important adjustment to their patent systems. So in particular, they were required to introduce pa uh, product patents on pharmaceuticals, which not all of them had prior to that point. Uh, and so that was a substantial change in patent law that was especially important in this particular sector. So I should make clear I'm only looking at one sector, and I wouldn't necessarily expect these results to apply across in other sectors. Uh, because this was controversial, because this was something that a lot of developing countries did not see as, as in their immediate interests, uh, they uh, negotiated a transition period. So TRIPS... Uh, Compliance was, was not required for most developing countries until 2000, 2005, and for uh, the least developed countries, it's been pushed out until 2016. Okay. And those deadlines have been renegotiated at various points. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we face this trade-off between the dynamic effects of, of intellectual property rights and the static effects. Uh, so just as a little bit more background on the dynamic effects, there are people who would argue we don't need patents. Okay. Um, so I think this is not the mainstream position from, uh, in, in most, uh, for most of the economics profession, but it is a position. Um, and I think it's a fair position in certain contexts. Um, so alternative mechanisms to, uh, to provide incentives for innovation, such as prizes or advanced market commitments, may be the most appropriate in certain situations. But 
the evidence overall is that across all industries, uh, the chemicals industry or pharmaceutical industry is the one that identifies patents as being extremely important for, uh, for them to make money on innovation. And the reason is that lacking patent protection ex post imitation of a successful product is pretty easy in pharmaceuticals relative to a lot of other kinds of products. And there's a large upfront cost of investment that the innovators need to somehow make back. The empirical evidence on the dynamic effects of patents is somewhat mixed. So my co-author has a paper that looked at the introduction of IPRs uh, mainly prior to, to the TRIPS period. She found that they were associated with an increase in domestic innovation, but this was largely isolated to relatively rich countries or relatively developed countries. So it's not the case that in a very poor country, we should expect that the introduction of patents is going to cause an immediate increase in the number of innovative firms and the number of patent applications coming from those firms in, in that country. Uh, Lanyell and Coburn in 2001 looked at the effect of the introduction of IPRs in pharmaceuticals in these developing countries on changes in R&D investment. And they found that there wasn't much of an immediate effect, at least not one they could pick up as of 2001, which was prior to the adoption of patent rights for most, for most developing countries, or product patents at least. Um, they didn't find a big increase in R&D directed at diseases that are most prevalent in developing countries. Uh, so I looked at this again uh, using more recent data. So the hope was that we've had some time to elapse now. Maybe, maybe there's hope of seeing something. Um, so with a co-author, we looked at uh, drug development efforts at the disease level. And what we were trying to do was exploit the fact that disease burden varies across countries. So malaria is much more prevalent in Africa than it is in the United States, obviously. Uh, the disease burden of HIV varies around the world. The disease burden of various cancers varies, et cetera. So we were looking at when a country that had a particularly high disease burden in this specific disease, when it changed its patent law, did that affect how much drug companies were willing to invest in new drugs to treat that disease? So now that there's patent protection in Africa, does that increase the uh, R&D effort directed at malaria? Um, so we found overall, if you look across all diseases, that there was an increase, uh, but that that effect was largely for global diseases, as in the ones that have a market in relatively rich countries. And the effect of introducing IPRs was linked to the income level of a country. So we would see a much bigger effect of introducing patents in a relatively rich developing country than one of the very poor ones. Okay. Uh, and so the introduction of patents in low-income countries does, did not seem to have shifted R&D development effort, R&D efforts, either for global diseases or for diseases with a high local burden. Okay. So when I mentioned that alternative mechanisms for inducing innovation may be appropriate in certain contexts, neglected diseases, the historically neglected diseases, is an example of such a context, that uh, introducing intellectual property rights is probably not going to be enough to get firms over that fixed cost burden. Because even with a patent, the price that a firm could charge for malaria treatment in many poor countries is just not going to allow it to cover those fixed costs. Okay. Um, so we concluded that the dynamic effects of IPRs for certain countries, for, for developing countries, were fairly limited. Now, that's still early, right? We, we could see that change over time. So first, developing countries are developing. So as they get richer and richer, the effect of intellectual property rights in those countries may be more pronounced. Uh, and you know it's still early. So maybe firms are just waiting to see how these markets develop, et cetera. Uh, but at least so far, we didn't see much, much in the way of dynamic effects. Yes? And if you refer to developing countries, uh, what is the concept that you're using? This is the great majority of the least developed countries. So I'm using the World Bank definition of um, upper middle income, lower middle income, and least developed countries. And when you're referring to developing countries, you're referring to the low income. I'm referring to upper middle income, lower middle income, and least developed. So in fact, most of my, uh, most of my sample is going to be from the middle income group, not the LDCs, because they haven't implemented patent protection yet, and because I don't have good data on them. Okay. So in terms of the, the static effects, um, economic theory would predict that actually we can solve a lot of the problems of, associated with the market power derived from IPRs 
uh, by having price discrimination or differential pricing. So this is, a, this is a setting in which there's general agreement that for most products, the marginal cost of producing a drug uh, are very low relative to the fixed cost of developing the drug. And so long as a firm can cover the marginal cost of producing that extra pill, it should be willing to sell at the marginal cost or anything above marginal cost price in any country around the world. Uh, in practice, we haven't seen that happen. Okay? And um, there are various reasons that, um, that firms and others have offered for why we don't see more price discrimination, more differential pricing, more tiered pricing. There's various uh, terms used for it. Um, some firms would, would point to the threat of parallel trade. So if we launch at a very low price in, in uh, let's say, Tunisia, there's a worry that that product is going to come back and cut into our market in Europe, for example. Um, now, that, that kind of gray market trade is not actually legal, but there are, it, it is legal within, your, within the European Union, and there are other situations where, uh, where it could be legal. Um, they also will point to the use of external reference pricing or international reference pricing. So if we set a very low price in one market, there's a risk that when we go to a developed country and we try and negotiate the price of that same product in this developed country, the regulator there will say, well, I see that you're offering this product at one third that price in this other country. So I don't want to pay more than that. Okay. Um, that kind of external reference pricing is widespread within Europe uh, and among some other countries. There's a question of what, uh, what are the countries to which this reference pricing refers. Uh, but you know, these, are, these are the arguments offered for why a firm might not want to price discriminate or use very low prices in poor countries, because that's going to have consequences for their ability to uh, set high prices in richer countries. In practice, uh, these static welfare losses are also addressed very directly by the use of price controls. Um, so almost all developed countries and now many developing countries regulate drug prices. So if, if, for example, in France, if you want to sell a drug in France, you have to negotiate with a committee, persuade this committee that you have an effective new product, argue about what the price should be. Um, and you know the French government, because it pays uh, a lot of the cost associated with providing this treatment to the French population, is of course interested in keeping the price uh, fairly low. Um, now, these policies can also make launch in a country less attractive or delay access for the same reasons uh, as listed above for international reference pricing and parallel trade. Yes. Thank you, Margaret. I'm Peter Bayer from the World Health Organization. I'm wondering, do you have data on that price controls are delaying access to medicines across developed and developing countries? So I do in the context of developed countries. Um, so I wrote a paper about this, uh, I think it was published 2007, looking particularly at developed countries or OECD countries. And uh, countries that use very stringent price controls and countries within Europe that are likely to be sources of parallel exports to the rest of Europe see fewer products launched or products launched with a longer delay. Okay. So there is some evidence that, that's, that, that that does take place in practice. Okay. Um, now, how important that is within the developing world, I think there's far less evidence on. Um, so a f one last point about the, the static effects in theory. Um, it's not always the case that patents are the only barrier to access. Uh, so in, in many countries, the populations may be too poor to even cover marginal cost. So it's not the existence of a patent that's preventing the drug from being launched. It's that there still is no market, when it, particularly in poor countries where you don't have a government providing uh, health insurance or health coverage to its population. If people are paying out of pocket, the market is just going to be very small in, for, for some products in particular. And there are other aspects of access that might be important. So it might be uh, good to have strong infrastructure, a cold chain, distribution channels, uh, complements like diagnostics, et cetera. And if you lack all of that, then even if you don't have a patent, it's not clear that there's this large set of generic firms that are willing to, to make a product available. Okay. Um, in terms of empirical evidence, uh, Lan Yao, a few, uh, now several years ago, uh, has a paper showing that IPRs were associated with faster launch of new drugs in rich countries, but the effect in poorer countries was ambiguous. Um, 
At very low income levels, as she pointed out, the ability to pay might not have exceeded marginal cost. And patents in that case are not the only barrier to access. Uh, and she also noted the existence of these regulatory spillovers uh, through reference pricing, et cetera. Uh, there's another very important paper in the economics literature uh, which looked at a single class of drugs in India, so a class of antibiotics, uh, prior to the introduction of patents in India. Okay, so this was a structural model that said, okay, this is, this is how competition takes place in this class of antibiotics. If we did a counterfactual uh, simulation and said, all right, we uh, now in introduce patents and remove generic com competitors from the market, what would we expect to see? Uh, they found that, uh, not surprisingly, the, the patent holder would increase the price, which has the negative effect uh, on, uh, on access, welfare, et cetera. But there was a follow-on effect, which is that if, the, uh, if one drug now no longer faces generic competition, it increases its price. The price of competing therapies, even if they still have generic competitors, will also tend to go up. Right, so in, in econ speak, prices are strategic complements. If the price of your competitor goes up, your best response is also to increase the price of your product. So there was an additional welfare loss associated with that. Um, so what we're trying to do in this paper is take advantage of the fact that now some time has elapsed so we can observe after the introduction of IPRs what's actually happened in, in a lot of these developing countries. Uh, so we're going to look at the speed of launch, uh, the price at which a product is, is made available, and its level of sales. We're looking at a large number of countries and across uh, a large number of drugs. So we're not looking, so the, um, this earlier paper was focused on a single class of drugs in a single country. Um, so we're going to try and look a bit broader than that uh, to see if, um, if that makes any difference. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that these are preliminary results, but what we have so far is that patents do appear to be associated with faster launch. Not surprisingly, patented drugs also have higher prices, uh, although these, the patent premium is not as high in developing countries as it is in developed countries. Uh, what's most surprising to us so far is that it doesn't appear that the prices of products with post-trips patents so these are the ones that should be the strongest. Uh, they don't appear to have changed very much. Okay, so it hasn't been the case that we've seen huge price increases on drugs that received patent protection under the post-trips regimes in developing countries. Okay. Um, so at least so far, may, there's some evidence that there could be some beneficial static effects for developing countries. Uh, but there are a number of important caveats that I will try to return to at the end and that I'm sure people, people here can, can think of some others. So the, the approach that we're going to take is uh, we're going to look at equilibrium, roughly speaking, equilibrium outcomes for launch delay, prices, and quantities uh, with and without IPRs. So we're going to exploit the fact that we can compare countries with IPRs to those that do not have IPRs. And I should say not just IPRs, I should be more specific. We're really going to focus on pharmaceutical product patents. Okay. Uh, we can compare the same country with and without IPRs for those that change their patent laws as a result of uh, becoming compliant with the TRIPS agreement. And we can compare the same drug and its outcome in different countries depending on whether it has IPR. Okay. Um, so there's a number of challenges associated with doing this in practice. Um, the first challenge we face is that uh, when a firm is deciding whether to introduce a product on the market, it's factoring in its expected price, its expected uh, quantity uh, that, it, that, it that it would sell when it makes the launch decision. It's also going to be accounting probably for things like external reference pricing or the threat of parallel trade. These are simultaneous choices. In practice, the way that we're going to deal with this is, uh, is not entirely satisfactory, but we're going to say, you know, we're going to look at launch, conditional on launch occurring, we'll look at price, conditional on price, we'll say, what is the quantity sold? Okay, so it's not a full structural model by any means. Uh, a more serious challenge for us is that the introduction of patents is an endogenous policy choice. Okay. So, there's a risk that if you just look before and after the introduction of patent protection, if you see an increase in price, for example, 
you can't you don't necessarily know that that increase in price is due just to the adoption of intellectual property rights because a country that adopts intellectual property rights may be getting richer and richer and richer countries have higher prices so if you just look before and after you might be misled okay um, and finally there are a number of other policies that some countries have probably adopted or have adopted in some cases that we know about and have probably adopted in cases where I'm unaware that specifically try to address some of this potential static costs associated with IPRs. So I'll come back to those again at the end. Uh, and again, this is an area where uh, insights from, from people here would be very uh, valuable to me. Margaret? Yes. Could I ask one question? I'm Still a little bit, uh, and maybe the question is a bit too early, um, confused about, if you wish, your counterfactual in a sense that, you know, if you ask yourself the question, what impact does the TRIPS or might the TRIPS agreement have on prices, I would actually argue there should be no impact in a okay. sense that, um, you know, for those drugs that were on the market before the TRIPS-induced patent protection kicked in, um, you know, those were in some sense up for grabs and you had generic competition. And the TRIPS obligations only applied to those you know, patents uh, that were applied for after the TRIPS changes uh, came into effect. And you know, those products you know, would then be introduced at a later point in time. But you know, those would be completely new products. And I wonder what the basis for comparison would be to comparing them to, the, to any type of pre-TRIP scenario. Right, so that's, that's a really important point, that another problem with just looking at the post-TRIPS period is that, in fact, uh, products that were already on the market would generally not qualify for patent protection, right? So if a, pro if a product was already on the market in India in 2002, it's not like it suddenly gets to get a patent in 2005 uh, when India becomes TRIPS compliant. So we wouldn't expect to see a change in price for products that, were, that didn't qualify for the post-TRIPS patent. Okay. So I have the measure of patent protection at the product level, and I'm going to control. I'm going to try do my best to try and control for the difference between having any patent or having a patent that was granted post trips. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure that I'll entirely address all of your concerns, uh, but at least I, I think this is the the best I can do about uh, to estimate the effect of having a post trips patent. Um, okay, so the endogeneity of IPRs, um, so as I've mentioned, uh, it's not like patent rights are randomly assigned across countries, right? So historically, patent protection IPRs are, are things that countries have chosen to adopt when they reached a certain level of development and saw it as in the interest of that country. Um, so for example, the U.S. was very happy to rip off the more developed countries at the time when it was still uh, an emerging market itself. Uh, and it's only after there were a lot of U.S. inventors that, uh, that wanted uh, protection that the, the U.S. would strengthen IPRs. Um, Canada, uh, so I'm going to just not pick on developing countries. I want to make, make the point that developed countries have also used IPRs very strategically in the past. Canada used to use compulsory licensing of pharmaceuticals to benefit its domestic generic industry uh, up until the early 1980s, which is when they signed the NAFTA agreement and the U.S. forced a change in that particular policy. Um, Having said that, by 19, 1995, most developed countries had already voluntarily adopted IPRs. Now, there was going to be some variation in the strength of that protection and how it was actually implemented, but as a, as a general statement, most rich countries had pharmaceutical product patents as of 95, but protection was, was weaker in most developing countries. Um, so, you know, in a, as an empirical study, the problem with just doing the pre-post comparison between countries that, um, that adopted IPRs and looking at how much prices changed in those countries versus countries where there was no change is that the set of countries that changed their IPRs are probably not randomly treated, right? They, in general, they would adopt patent protection when they saw it as in their interest. And so it's not really a natural experiment, okay? Now, we're, we kind of argue that TRIPS forced the adoption of IPRs in a lot of these countries that, would not, that did not appear to be very willing to do so initially. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's a problem with, uh, with most historical studies that have looked at the effect of IPRs, is that it's, it's not, there's a selection into treatment. There's a selection into being a treated country. Um, so 
there's one approach that one could take to try to deal with that, and that's to use instrumental variables and say, well, we're going to use WTO uh, required compliance dates. Um, it's not a perfect instrument, so for those who are immersed in um, studies of instrumental variables, this is not a perfect instrument because the required compliance dates were still correlated with income level and correlated with the incentive that a country would have to adopt IPRs on its own. What we're going to do is to focus on this difference between drugs that qualified for a post-trips patent versus those that, uh, that had a priority date just before they would have qualified for that. Okay. So we're going to say that the uh, priority date, the initial application date of a drug's patent would determine its selection into being a treated product, and that that is exogenous to the policy change. Um, so in practice, how does that work? That means that a drug that had a priority date in 1999 would not have qualified for a product patent in Malaysia or in India. If it had a priority date in 2003, it could qualify for a, pa a product patent in Malaysia, but not India, although it could try for a mailbox patent in India. Uh, and in 2006, at that point, India is also supposed to be TRIPS compliant, and uh, India, in principle, should be granting a product patent uh, on, that, on that product. Um, so we'll run regressions of this form. The dependent variable is going to be either launch, price conditional on launch, or quantity conditional on having launched and setting a price. Uh, we're going to have a dummy variable for whether the country uh, is a TRIPS-treated country, as in it changed its uh, pharmaceutical patent law as a result of, uh, of TRIPS. Uh, we'll interact that with a dummy variable for the post-TRIPS period. Uh, we'll look at the effect of a drug having a patent, interact that with whether this is a TRIPS country, and uh, I have a triple interaction between this is a country that changed its patent laws to comply with TRIPS, this is a patented, patented drug, and this is a post-TRIPS patent on that drug. Okay. Um, so we're basically trying to pull out the fixed effect of being different as a TRIPS-treated country and any change in that set of countries that is not associated, um, change in prices, et cetera, that might be associated just with a general increase in development, et cetera, from the effect of having a pharmaceutical product patent specifically on this product. Okay, so what we're really going to focus on is that, that triple interaction. One yeah. question. Your TRIPS country variable is not time variant? No. No. So we'll have the interaction with whether this is a post-TRIPS year or quarter for that TRIPS-treated country. But uh, we're, we're trying to get at the, the fact that the set of countries that were required by TRIPS to change their patent laws are going to be a fundamentally different group than the countries that were already compliant by 95. But how do you get at the fact that different countries implemented the TRIPS obligations at different times. So that the post-TRIPS period is going to vary by country and year or quarter. And that is according to the deadline of the TRIPS agreement or according to when countries implemented the law? We're going to use the actual compliance date. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, We've run some robustness checks to make sure that it doesn't matter whether we use too much, whether we matter, use the actual compliance date or the required compliance date. Okay. okay. Um, so the data that I'm using uh, comes from IMS Health. So they have uh, a database that they call MIDAS, which tracks uh, prices and sales of products across a large set of countries. Um, the data comes to us at the package level, so the same drug can appear in many different presentations. We're going to, uh, but the presentations vary a lot across countries, so we're going to aggregate that up to the product level, and the data is quarterly. We have this from 2000 to 2011. Uh, there's a total of 60 countries, and we, for the, for the set of products in that data, we also have their first launch date anywhere in the world, their global launch date, and their local launch date. Um, so we convert the sales, which come to us in local currency. Uh, we, so we adjust that for local inflation, convert it to 2011 U.S. dollars, just so that we can compare prices across countries. We're going to exclude certain classes of drugs for which we didn't have very complete data across all the countries. So that's going to uh, include diagnostics, hospital solutions, and injectables. And we're going to focus on drugs that were first launched after 1990 and in at least two markets. 
The reason for that limitation is the drugs first launched since 1990 are the ones for which patent protection was relevant at some point during this period. Uh, in at least two markets, the reason for that is that we have China and India in this data. China and India both have a large uh, alternative medicine or uh, uh, herbal therapy market of products that probably wouldn't qualify for patent protection anywhere, but also are specific to those countries. So they're not widely available, and it's hard for us to, um, to do any kind of comparison across countries for, uh, for products like that. And then finally, we need to match these drugs to patent information. So that leaves us with a total of 516 uh, products. So we also have uh, uh, country-level controls from the World Bank, the World Development Indicators data set. Uh, what is very important for us is how we measure IPRs. Um, and I'm sure that uh, people in this audience will have a lot of, uh, of issues with some of the shortcuts that we've taken. Um, we looked at, first, TRIPS required compliance. So according to the WTO, when should this country have been compliant with TRIPS? Some of them complied early, some of them delayed compliance a little bit, so, um, so we ultimately moved to actual TRIPS compliance, and for this, uh, Inton was extremely helpful. So um, since she had done prior work trying to look at, uh, identify specifically when developing countries had become TRIPS compliant, uh, we used data from her. Um, and then our patent information at the drug level comes from another IMS data source called Patent Focus. That gives us the number of patent applications at the country level and the type of patent applications at the country level for each drug. Okay. Um, so that'll give us the initial global patent application date, which uh, more or less determines eligibility for protection. So I'm working under the assumption that um, whatever the priority year is, uh, is going to be the priority year everywhere. So uh, if I apply for a product patent in 1999, I have to apply for that uh, for, for protection in all other countries that I want protection in by 2000. Okay. okay. Um, so and people here will probably know this, but usually um, this, is, this requires a lot of uh, explanation to people who are not down in the weeds of patent data. Um, Sometimes in the, in the economics literature, the difference between the pre-trips and post-trips period is a little bit oversimplified. It's not, in general, the case that compliance with the TRIPS agreement all of a sudden introduced a patent system. For most of these countries, there was some kind of patent system prior to its perfect compliance with TRIPS. Um, but that patent system might not have provided the same level of patent protection. Um, so there are patents that exist in countries that were not actually TRIPS compliant in, in any given year. We, I mean, we can't ignore the fact that there's patent protection of some sort. All we can try and do is say there's something fundamentally different about those patents versus those that were granted after TRIPS compliance. Okay. Um, it's also the case that uh, most drugs have multiple types of patents. Um, so the most important is typically considered the product patent. Um, but they can continue to apply for process patents on the manufacturing, on uh, patents for new uses in some case, et cetera. So it's, it's not like there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between drug and patent, right? It's, it's generally a one-to-many correspondence. Um, there are also cases where um, drugs get patent extensions because they spent a long time being reviewed at the patent office. Uh, or supplementary protection certificates. Um, sometimes these follow-on patents can be effective. That's part of uh, the debate in the US and Europe now over uh, these follow-on patents and, their, uh, and whether firms are able to evergreen their products as a result of using these follow-on patents. And there can also be data exclusivity uh, in place uh, even when there's not a patent. Okay. Um, so for this, for this version of the paper, when we say a patent to drug, what we mean is um, there's a product patent in force in that country in that quarter. Okay, so um, this is post the grant date of the patent and prior to the expiration date. Okay, okay. Um, again, just as, as a bit of background, um, how pharmaceutical firms have used IPRs, and well, patents in particular, varies a lot. Um, across product, et cetera. So here's just a few examples. If you look at Lipitor, which was until recently uh, the most, the, the highest selling drug in the world, I think. Um, this is a Pfizer product. They patented it in 87 countries. The first patent application was in 1986. 
They were still applying for patents on Lipitor up through 2011. Okay. So obviously those later patents can't provide or shouldn't be providing the same level of protection as that initial patent on the molecule. But nevertheless, Pfizer sees it as, it's, as in its interest to continue trying to patent aspects of this product. Uh, Gleevec, which is a cancer treatment, has been patented in 66 countries. Again, you see a long period after the initial patent application during which follow-on patents are, are submitted. And an HIV medication, Norvir, patented in 53 countries. Again, a big difference between the last patent application and the initial patent. There are a lot of situations where we see a drug without a patent in a country, and what's hard for us to, to figure out is, is there no patent in that country because the innovator didn't think this was going to generate any profits, even if they had a patent? Um, is it that the innovator didn't bother applying for the patent uh, because they didn't expect it to be granted or didn't think it was worth having a patent because it wouldn't be enforced or because it just wasn't necessary to have it there? Okay. Um, so in other words, the incentive to patent ha is also going to be varying over time. And we don't have a great way of controlling for that other than throwing in country controls, et cetera. Okay. But that's certainly uh, an issue that we face. OK, um, so this is work in progress. Um, there's a bunch of data issues that we haven't yet resolved that, we would, uh, that we're still trying to, to make progress on. So one issue uh, is that under TRIPS, compulsory licensing of pharmaceutical product patents is permitted under certain circumstances. So if there's a public health emergency, a country can declare uh, that this patent is going to be inval not, not exactly invalidated, but that um, it, won't, it, it will be compulsory licensed out. Um, that we have some information on the compulsory licenses that were actually issued in practice, S some additional information on when there was a threat made to, to issue a compulsory license. Um, so we'd like to try and control for that. Now, we, we can measure a threat if it showed up in a press report of some sort, but even the unstated threat of compulsory licensing is potentially important here. Uh, and again, we'll return to that issue later. Um, there are some other changes that have occurred during this time period. So in particular, uh, there are other kinds of trade agreements that have been signed, uh, and some of them require what have been termed TRIPS plus changes. Um, so this is something that, in particular, the US Trade Representative has been pushing for. So these are stronger data exclusivity terms, stronger patent protection in general. Um, so we're collecting that kind of information to, to control for as well. So these are preliminary findings, so subject to change. You know, these additional controls might, uh, might change some of our results. But I'm going to uh, present the equation by equation uh, triple diff uh, estimates of launch price and quantity where we don't try and directly deal for the endogeneity of uh, IPR adoption using instrumental variables. Um, what we are assuming is that after a country is compliant with TRIPS, that um, there's no endogeneity in patent grants. Okay. Um, and this is actually suspect. And again, I'll come back to that uh, at the end. OK. So our sample includes a total of 60 countries, uh, about half of which are high-income countries, and the remaining um, are lower middle income or upper middle income. And we don't have any of the least developed countries in this data set. Um, unfortunately, we don't have great representation from sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that's a limitation. Um, so again, these results are only subject to, I mean, are subject to the caveat that we don't have everything. Okay, So just this uh, subset of countries. Um, the TRIPS compliance deadlines for most high-income countries was at the time they joined the WTO in 1995, so they had to be compliant as of uh, January 1st, 1996. Uh, for most developing countries, that was pushed out to 2000. For countries that did not grant pharmaceutical product patents at the time they joined, they got an additional extension for that till 2005. Um, and so you can see the distribution there. Um, we're going to end in, in practice. We'll use the year of actual TRIPS compliance, which is spread out a bit more because some countries chose to adopt uh, TRIPS compliance systems early and some delayed a little bit. Can I ask, sorry, yeah. one clarifying question mm -hmm. on this one. When you say TRIPS compliance, you mean specifically compliance with the obligation to protect pharmaceutical products? Yes. yes. Okay. To the extent that we can, that, that, that we can capture that well. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you know, one issue is, Maybe they're granting. Maybe officially they're granting pharmaceutical product patents, but are they enforcing? Right. I, that I, I don't have a great way of picking up. Right. 
Yeah, um, we still say it's fairly objective in a sense. This is a matter of law. Whether, right. You know, the law provides for pharmaceutical. Right. So, so it's a matter of law. Right. right. Um, so that's what we have: is has has the law actually been changed? Yep. Um, Okay, so the data set is going to end up being structured as a, a drug country quarter observation. So when we look at launch, we're going to consider a drug at risk for launch in any quarter after it's been launched somewhere in the world up until the point where it's launched in the specific country in this quarter. And at that point, it drops out of the data. Um, so because a lot of launch does not occur, there's going to be a very high number of country, uh, of drug country quarter observations with launch as being a very rare event. So it's not that it was, I mean, I'll show you a, a probably more useful measure of, um, of a drug's launch in a, in a couple of slides, but the way that the data set is structured, launch has a mean of only 0.01. So I point that out because when we look at the results from the regressions, the coefficients are going to look very small, but their marginal changes off a very small uh, number, uh, off a very small uh, dependent variable. Um, the TRIPS, TRIPS country dummy uh, is equal to one for about 61% of the observations here. Uh, in part, that's because uh, tr if you are a TRIPS-treated country and launch takes longer, those drug country quarter observations are going to be in the data set longer. Okay. So um, I don't want to go into too many of the details. It's just to explain how the data set is structured. Uh, when we get to estimating price or quantity, now we only have an observation after the drug has been launched in a country. Okay. And then we have it until uh, 2011. So the drug will end up with a price observation in a drug country quarter after it's been launched and stay there until 2011. And so that's why now the TRIPS uh, country dummy observations are a smaller fraction of, of the data. Okay, okay. Um, so before we get into the regressions, just some simple uh, statistics on, uh, on launches, et cetera. So if we look at the set of drugs that were launched sometime after 1990 and uh, break it down by income group, you can see that uh, high income OECD countries get about half of that population of drugs at some point during our, uh, our time, time period here. Um, they have about 3.7 patents. Okay. Um, so now some of those will expire during that time period, but at some point during that time period, they had 3.7 patents on average. And um, there's a very small rate of what I'll, I call illegal generics, illegal in that I don't really know whether they're fully legal or not, but um, generic competition in the presence of a, uh, of a product patent that is still active in that country. Okay. Um, for poorer countries, as you go down the income level, you get lower levels of launch. Okay, so as in, there's only 27% of this set of, uh, of new drugs, or drugs that were new at some point during the 1990 to 2011 period, only 27% of them make it to low income country, low, low middle income countries. Um, and there are fewer patents in poorer countries. Now, in part because they might not have been granting patents, in part because firms might not have seen it as worthwhile to even bother applying for patents. Okay. If you look at just the effect of having a product patent, um, you see that having a product patent is slightly more likely to make a product uh, available in a country, but not that much more. Um, product patents are also linked with a higher number of other patents on this particular drug. Um, if you look at uh, how long it takes for a drug to be made available in a, in a country, we broke this down by how long it takes the originator, the patent holder, to make a product available, the originator or uh, somebody to whom it is licensed, uh, versus uh, generics. So again, you see originators launch in rich countries first and poor countries last. Okay, so that's not particularly surprising, um, except that if you think they should be willing to launch at any price that covers marginal cost, and there's a patent clock ticking, they should want to launch as quickly as possible everywhere. Okay. Uh, but there are uh, longer delays getting to lower middle income uh, markets. If you look at how long it takes generics to get into the market, um, you can see in high income countries where there's more likely to be a product patent, there's more likely to be other kinds of patents protecting a drug, it takes generics about seven and a half years to get in. Now, patents are 20 years, but the drug development process is very long. Okay, so it is not unusual for a drug to spend 10 years in clinical trials before it gets released anywhere in the world. So the period of patent protection for pharmaceuticals effectively 
um, if you look at from the initial application date, it's, it's 20 years plus maybe a little bit of uh, extensions. But in practice, they're, they're not getting 20 years of product patent protection on the market. Um, generics get to market a little bit quicker in lower, lower middle income countries or poorer countries more generally. Again, there's fewer patents acting as a barrier to generic entry. Okay. Um, but you know, there's still a pretty long delay, even, for, even when there is no patent. Um, if we look at uh, the subset of products that were first launched sometime after 2000, so now we see that launch is actually even more widespread among rich countries. It hasn't changed that much for the lower to middle, lower uh, middle income group. Okay. Um, and patenting seems to have picked up a little bit. Again, you see a higher number of patents per drug. Um, now it's up to 4.2 instead of 3.7 in relatively rich countries. So there was a uh, report a couple of years ago from DG Comp on uh, the use of patent thickets in pharmaceuticals within the European Union. Uh, there's some worry that patents are acting, patent thickets are acting as a barrier to entry for generics. It is the case that uh, the number of patents per product has been increasing okay, in rich countries. Um, for, uh, for how quickly that set of products becomes available, again, its uh, launch is becoming quicker in the high-income countries. It has gotten quicker in the lower-middle-income countries, too, although there's still you know, two or three years delay uh, compared with, uh, with rich countries. Looking at the years to generic entry, that's somewhat misleading because um, there's not that many products that were launched after 2000 for which patents have, um, have expired so that generics can get, can get into the market. So, um, so there's not much uh, information in that first column. Okay, so if I finally get to uh, regression results, um, so with this first set, what we're using as our definition of, uh, of patent for the purpose of this patented drug dummy and the interactions, what we're looking at is the existence of an active uh, product patent. Okay. Um, so in this set of regressions, we have year fixed effects and drug fixed effects, but not country fixed effects. Okay. So the TRIPS country is picking up the difference between the set of countries that changed their uh, patent law as a result of becoming compliant with TRIPS versus everybody else, which is roughly going to be the high income versus developing country breakdown. Okay. Um, so um, there, what you can see is that actually the um, TRIPS country dummy doesn't seem to have a very big effect for launch, um, but, and, and actually is associated with slightly lower, slower launch post-TRIPS. Uh, patented drugs are associated with quicker launch, uh, but there's uh, not much going on there with the interactions, so no big changes uh, uh, post-TRIPS and no big changes uh, comparing developed countries to TRIPS-treated countries. With price, not surprisingly, TRIPS-treated countries have lower prices. Um, Post-TRIPS, there is a positive but insignif statistically insignificant coefficient on that first interaction. Um, patented drugs ha have about 20% higher prices on average. And again, the interactions with uh, TRIPS country and patented drugs and the triple diff there are generally insignificant. Okay. Uh, quantities are lower in these TRIPS-treated countries. Um, patented drugs sell in higher quantities, which is a little bit surprising, um, and uh, slightly higher quantities in the post-TRIPS period for, um, for TRIPS countries. Now, again, that's not that additional quantity is just picking up probably the fact that these TRIPS-treated countries are growing and the markets for all drugs are getting bigger. That's not the effect of having a patent on this specific drug. That would be picked up by that, by that last triple interaction. If you include country fixed effects, so now we're not going to be able to separately identify the TRIPS country dummy because that's going to be the same for any given country uh, across all time periods. Um, so we'll just focus on, on these interactions. Uh, launch seems to have gotten slightly slower for all drugs. Um, patented drugs, again, are associated with faster launch. Uh, the interactions are insignificant for launch. Um, for price, again, prices are slightly lower in TRIPS countries. Patented drugs are more expensive. But now, if you look at this, this last interaction, the set of products that have qualified for post-TRIPS patents in TRIPS countries actually have slightly lower prices. Okay. So you have to, in order to get the net effect, you need to add in the patent dummy uh, 
and all of these interactions, right? So you'll end up with about 3% higher prices, okay? Uh, as compared with if, you, if it's um, a pre-TRIPS patented drug, it would be uh, almost 9%. So that was very surprising to us anyway. Um, now, a lot of that is being driven off a fairly small set of products because in order for a product to qualify for a post-TRIPS patent in a lot of developing countries, it means that it has to have a patent, an initial patent application date after 2000 or after 2005 for some of these countries. After 2005, uh, we have data through 2011, that would be a very short period of clinical development before it gets launched. So there's just not that many products that have a post-2005 application date that are on the market as of 2011. Okay, so that's an important caveat here. We don't have that many products to, to identify this, this extra difference for the, for the countries that became compliant in the later years. For the ones that changed over in 2000, we have more evidence. Okay. We have more products uh, to use. Um, if instead of just using product uh, patents, I look at the existence of any patent, and I've also run regressions where we look at uh, the number of patents on this particular product in this country in this quarter, um, the results are, are very similar to what I showed you before. Um, so I won't go through the coefficients in detail. Product patents are a little bit more important, which isn't too surprising. I mean, that's really the important patent. Um, you don't see huge differences um, with these other sets. Okay, so the summary of what we found so far, uh, it looks like patents overall increase the speed of launch, okay? Um, launch incentives probably matter more for originators in general than they do for generics, okay? Now, that's not, um, that is less true for, for these TRIPS-treated countries, okay? But patents overall are associated with faster launch, which is consistent with some of the earlier work um, that's out there. Patents also are associated with higher prices. Um, what was sort of surprising to us is that post-trips, that price premium is actually a little bit smaller. Conditional on launch and price, uh, patented products sell in lower quantities in TRIPS-treated countries, which is also somewhat surprising to me. So I thought, okay, once, an, once the originator has a patent in this TRIPS-treated country, and it's not worried about sharing the market with generics, it should have incentives to make country-specific investments, market the drug, invest in infrastructure, and really push out the demand curve. So I expected actually to see higher quantities sold, um, which I'm not seeing. Okay. Okay, so then for, for us, really, the challenge is, what do we make of this? So what's the right way to interpret uh, these results? Um, so I think one point to make is that the lack of a patent doesn't guarantee entry by generics in most countries. So that's not as evident from the regressions, but if you look uh, at some of the appendix tables where we break down um, whether the originator was the first to market or a generic was first to market, India and a few other countries that have big generic sectors will see generic entry prior to an originator entry if there's no patent. But for the most part, generics follow originators. So even when there's no patent, generic firms are going to follow the originator. And maybe the reason is that originators are in a better position to provide the regulatory information about safety and eff efficacy than a generic would be, right? It depends on whether local regulators allow a generic applicant to rely on the regulatory dossier in other countries or if they insist on seeing uh, specific clinical trials. Um, we also find that patents are associated with higher prices, but a lower premium in developing countries after trips. And we're wondering if that's because all of a sudden uh, pharmaceutical firms have changed their policies on differential pricing, uh, or if they're doing more voluntary licensing, which is lowering prices in some of these developing countries, or if that's a, a response to other policies, as in, okay, a country puts in patent rights, right, or product patents, but at the same time, they adopt stricter price controls, right, to, uh, to knock the price down. So even though you now have a patent, you, you can prevent generic competition, uh, you're, it's not like you can charge the monopoly price that you might want, right? You're going to be negotiating with the government, and the, if the government puts in stricter price controls, that price is going to be a little bit lower. It could be the threat of compulsory licensing. Um, the relationship between patents and total quantity sold is, again, less clear. Um, are there policies that favor generics? Is it lack of marketing effort by originators? Uh, we don't really have a good sense of that yet. Okay. Um, 
Again, our results are preliminary, and there's lots of factors that we haven't controlled for that we would like to be able to address more directly. Um, so in particular, when I say the effect of IPRs on price and access, et cetera, it's not really the effect of IPRs, it's the effect of TRIPS as implemented so far, right? So TRIPS plus all other associated policies. Okay. So it could be that in the absence of these other policy changes, which I'll um, start going through in a second, we would have seen bigger effects on price, right, or bigger effects on launch. Okay. Um, but at least anecdotally, I know that there have been a number of other policies in developing countries that um, are largely a response to concerns about reduced access as a result of IPRs. So in some cases, that's um, changing patent office rules. In some cases, that's threatening compulsory licensing. And in some cases, it's price controls. Um, and I should note also that we haven't included here the potential interaction with NGO activities or political pressures on price. Um, so a lot of that has been focused mainly on HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. But that could be spilling over to how pharmaceutical firms are thinking about pricing their other products in, in some of these countries. Um, so to go through those in a little bit more detail, um, different standards of patentability. Um, so there was a decision rather recently in India on uh, a Novartis patent on this cancer drug, Gleevec. Um, the first application for this drug, for, uh, I, should, I should note, was prior to India's compliance with official compliance with, with TRIPS. Um, but essentially, what Novartis, what Novartis did was they had an initial patent, and then they applied for um, for another product patent or another patent on a slightly different version of the same chemical. Um, and I think they had improved things like um, the manufacturing process or the cost of, of actually producing the product, et cetera. And they received that extra patent in a lot of other countries. Okay. Uh, India rejected it. Um, and this was something that Novartis fought for for many years. Uh, and finally, you know, there was the Supreme Court uh, decision on that a couple months ago. Um, that's not the only situation for which that's, that's occurred. So there was also a, a case of an HIV drug for which uh, the Indian Patent Office rejected an additional patent application on, I think it was the heat-stable version of this particular HIV drug. And the argument that the Indian Patent Office has used is that you know, there's just not an inventive step there. You don't qualify for an extra patent. Okay. Um, so that's a different patent office policy or, or rule uh, than what, for example, the US Patent Office has used. Um, compulsory licensing. Um, so this, again, this is the threat of compulsory licensing might be really important in practice, even if you don't observe that many compulsory licenses issued. Uh, but there's a recent paper that has, um, has looked at compulsory licensing. You see, I mean, I would say that's not huge numbers of compulsory licenses, you know, in terms of the total number of drugs for which a compulsory license might be issued. They're not necessarily restricted just to developing countries. So high-income countries occasionally uh, discuss compulsory licensing as well. So for example, the, the US, when uh, there was the anthrax scare in 2001, there was a single treatment for anthrax, which was a, a drug made by Bayer. And there were several senators who were very concerned about having a monopolist owning the rights to this treatment for anthrax. And so it turned out that anthrax, we didn't have a you know, big outbreak. Uh, but there were U.S. senators who were saying, you know, we need to look into compulsory licensing of this drug. And the same thing has happened with flu treatments at various points. Um, it's not just developing countries who decide to, to threaten this every once in a while. Um, political pressures on the pharmaceutical industry, I think, have uh, substantially increased over recent years. So in particular, after, you know, with the HIV uh, issue, the AIDS epidemic in Africa, I think... Um, there were some studies in the 1990s that showed that prices of some of these products were actually higher in poor countries than in rich countries, higher than the U.S. price. And that was horrifying to a lot of people out there. And uh, there's been a lot of pressure put on drug companies since then to make their products uh, more affordable in poorer countries. So this is just an example of... Um, of an index out there that's that's monitoring these various companies and scoring them on how well they do on these various dimensions of making their products uh, accessible in poor countries. Um, so Gilead here is uh, is at the top. 
um, on pricing. Gilead actually has a policy of issuing voluntary licenses for some of its HIV treatments in, uh, in developing countries. Um, but it could be that this change in pricing that we observe post-trips is a response to these kinds of political pressures. So yeah, now maybe they have a patent, but it's not like they're able to exploit the patent as much as maybe they once could have. Okay? Um, and then there's also the possibility that price controls have been introduced. Um, so, you know, this is um, a news article saying, look, announcing that price controls reduce the price of medicines entering the Brazilian market. I have to say that if we found that price controls increased the price of medicines entering the Brazilian market, we would <laughs> wonder what kind of price control policy that was. Uh, but anyway, to the extent that these uh, price controls are introduced in response to a concern about higher prices associated with patents, right, that's going to counteract the market power that originators have. Now, it still could be profitable for them to have this patent and prevent generic competition. They still get 100% share of whatever, uh, of whatever they make available but they may not be able to charge prices that are as high as, uh, as they would like. Um, there's also the possibility that firms have changed their pricing strategies uh, optimally, that they've decided differential pricing, even not in response to political pressure, but just differential pricing makes sense from a profit maximization standpoint. Um, so this is an example of a recent announcement on cancer vaccines that, of course, they're not going to lose the opportunity to, um, to make this public that they're cutting prices in poor countries. Um, but, you know, to the extent that uh, pharmaceutical firms are now less concerned about parallel trade or less concerned about international reference pricing because they've successfully persuaded governments in developed countries that they should not be referencing the price in Brazil or should not be referencing the price in South Africa, and that makes them more comfortable making products available at very low prices in those countries, you know, that could also be an explanation for, for what we observe. Um, now, obviously, I'd like to be able to, to say more about that. Right now, this, I'm giving you a series of anecdotes. Uh, what I'd really like to do is say, well, it's definitely this story. Um, so one last one, uh, voluntary licenses. Um, so you know, this is another possibility. It could be that the originator decides they don't really want to mess with this developing country. They don't want to bother figuring out how to market there and making the big investments, but they issue voluntary licenses so that there is effectively generic competition in some of these countries. Gilead is still making some money, right? They're still getting a license fee, um, uh, but the, the product is perhaps more, more accessible because of this competition between the generic firms. Um, okay, so let me wrap up so that we still have time for discussion. Um, you know, I think these policy questions around IPRs are obviously of extremely uh, high interest, not just in this, in this uh, auditorium, but, uh, but in general. I think particularly as we see these bilateral agreements being negotiated, which uh, often include these TRIPS plus obligations, um, we, should, we should have a good understanding of what exactly that's going to mean. Um, it's also important for the debates on the appropriate use of compulsory licenses or the appropriate use of price controls. So um, should we be more precise about under what circumstances compulsory licensing is acceptable? Should it be used more, more broadly? Um, a lot of pharmaceutical firms complain about the use of price controls in developed countries in addition to developing countries. That's a huge issue in the US right now, which doesn't formally have price controls. But once the government starts picking up a larger share of the pharmaceutical tab, maybe there's going to be a move in that direction. Um, and we think that you know, a lot of the debate here ends up being very polarized. In practice, I don't think that there's such a clear-cut story. Um, so at least from what we've been able to, to find so far, we do find that IPRs are associated with higher prices, but maybe it's not as bad as was feared for the post-trips period. Um, IPRs are also associated with faster launch, right? so maybe, maybe the effect of IPRs on access in, isn't as bad as a lot of people were worried about. Um, now, I should say that I, mean, I mentioned an earlier paper that I had on the dynamic effects, and I found that putting in patent protection in developing countries did not shift R&D incentives very substantially. Well, this is actually consistent with that, right? If I would be most worried if we found no change in R&D, but we found huge increases in price, 
right? That would be the worst of all worlds. If prices haven't changed that much and profits haven't changed that much, then it's not surprising that R&D also hasn't adjusted, right? So this is basically consistent with implementing IPRs in a lot of these developing countries, hasn't shifted profits that much, right? And therefore hasn't shifted R&D incentives, hasn't shifted prices that much, okay? Now, again, I want to emphasize that in particular for this second, the second statement on, on prices, et cetera, this is very preliminary work. Um, so I think there's a lot of these important controls that, that we need to have better information on. Okay? So voluntary licenses, compulsory licenses, better information on the use of price controls, better, uh, better understanding of what's going on at these different patent offices. Um, we think that probably um, there's also a very different story in, very, in different countries. Right? So IPRs might be hugely important in certain countries and irrelevant in others. Um, so, for example, in India, putting in patent protection and shutting down uh, generic production of a lot of drugs, or, I mean, they're not going to shut down generic production of stuff that's already being produced, but it's going to certainly limit the, the size of the market for generic producers for some time. There, IPRs are going to be really important. But in other countries without that generic sector, maybe the introduction of IPRs doesn't matter as much, right? So the optimal uh, extent or uh, level of IPRs, as I mentioned at the beginning, is probably going to vary across countries. And uh, their own policy choices are going to reflect those different interests. Okay. So I'm happy to move to discussion now. Thank you.